The initial title for this was Web Scraping as a Test Design Approach Using Selenium 2.0. Really, it's about doing test automation in a pragmatic way. So this is coming down to macho web automation. If the A team did test automation, if they did web automation, these are the thought processes they'd use. If the expendables did web automation, these are the thought processes they would use. So if you want to pump up your automation muscles, this is what we're going to cover. In fact, it's a case study. It's a story. It's a true story. And we'll cover some of the context around that. But really, this is about the automation thought processes. This is about focusing on the context that you're working within, not letting the standard rules impact you, dealing with what there is, dealing with fast timescales, making your automation work pragmatically. So as you watch this, you can think, what would you do under these circumstances. Imagine the decisions that are being made to work out what's coming next. I don't really like case studies that spend a long time describing the system and the company they're in, but we've got no choice sometimes. We have to show you some of the context. So this is basically a registration system. It's a web-based front end with multiple forms, with multiple pages, with lots of fields that you type in, with certain fields not being enabled until you type in other fields. The registration system is available in multiple languages, so there's a translation aspect. You can move from one page to another and you submit the form into a sales service that stores all the stuff on a database. Then ultimately, when you finish the workflow, it gets sent through to a registration system. And this is being sourced by an outsourced company on their machines with the messages being sent to the, the company that we're testing for. And this is a them and us situation. It's always a them and us situation. Don't let them tell you otherwise. So the basic reason for outsourcing the registration system when there's an internal one is that the registration is not core functionality for the application. Therefore, why would you spend a lot of time maintaining it? We're about to release in multiple languages. So why would you invest in a translation when someone else can do that? And there were issues with the previous registration functionality. You had mismatches between the front end and the back end that happened in live. So people in, a, in some country couldn't register because the back end server had the, the, the country spelled differently. And people wanted faster fixing of the registration system, but the, the core business functionality was, was the priority. So the, we, it was being outsourced. And uh, this was an agile company that was doing the outsourcing. And outsourced suppliers love agile companies because when the project is being communicated to them, you explain you're an agile company and you explain how you work. And they don't work in that way. They don't work on a basis of trust. They work on a basis of contractual obligation. So they don't necessarily give you what you want because you haven't communicated to them ultimately what you value from them as a supplier. You're expecting them to work with you when they're expecting to fulfill the terms of the contract. So ultimately, when the system was delivered, it had been hacked together. It hadn't really been, t hadn't been tested at all on their side. They would write the code, compile it, and commit it straight into the environment as a deploy. Um, and it would go into the environment. It wasn't a development environment. There wasn't a test environment. There was just an environment, a big buggy environment that people were developing in and testing in at the same time. So when testers raised a bug, as they did frequently, because every time they used the system, they found bugs, the developer would change the code on the fly. And we would see bugs as it was being changed. We would see a bug possibly get fixed as a result of those changes. And everything else might have changed. There might have been bugs now introduced in areas that you had already tested. And it got to the point after probably about a week of three testers manually testing this thing and raising hundreds of defects and, and it being quite obvious that this system was not ready, not even ready to test, that we decided to introduce some automation because that's what you do. So starting to think about automation, the main reasons for automating were to decide if the system was actually ready for manual testing because we're wasting so much time testing the system. It's essentially throwaway automation in the sense that we could update it and make it long term, but really we're trying to fix a problem where we're wasting so much time. So the automation was designed to get us around that. Because of this, it had to be done quickly. We had to really get this stuff done quickly. But under these circumstances, 
Traditionally, you shouldn't automate yet. Traditionally, you automate when your system is stable. You automate when you've done your testing manually. You automate when you have a tight spec. You automate when you have a budget because automation takes a long time. Automated tools are expensive. You automate when you have a test environment so things are stable for you. But over time, we've learned automation approaches that help us get over some of these traditional objections when your system is not stable. You have abstraction layers, you have page objects. Ultimately, our tests are viable, are valid, whether the system is ready or not. The things we want to do are the things we want to do. The implementation that unpins them might change, but our tests, the automated checks we want to do, probably won't change. So we abstract our tests away from the implementation of the system. It doesn't really matter if we've tested it manually or not, because we know what tests, we know what checks we want to put in place. So we can do this stuff in parallel. We can stop automating if it becomes completely not viable. We can stop manually testing if it's unviable. We don't have to have starting and stopping constraints. If we don't have a spec, we'll use the system itself to tell us what the limits are. This is a web system. If you read the HTML code, you can see what limits have been encoded in there. We know some of the formats that we want to do for the data that we want to accept, so we can randomize data around that. This is a web application, so it has drop downs. Those drop downs define the scope of what can be put in that input field, so we can scrape that off the front end. We can work with a changing system with changing values because we can pull it off the application that's delivered. I've never had a budget. Doesn't matter, it doesn't stop me doing automation, we can use open source tools. And we have an IDE that can let us run quickly, so it doesn't, none of the traditional objections really matter if what we're trying to do is put something in quickly that will stop us wasting time. One of the things about test automation, there's model-based test automation, which is very often viewed as a very complicated thing, as a very big thing is, is you have to build state models and drive your testing from that. But really all testing stems from models. All your manual testing stems from models. It stands from your mental models. It stems from what you want to do. And if you start recognizing that you have models already in your automation, then you can think through this process differently. If you recognize that every automated script, every automated set of checks, every everything that's annotated with at test in your automation layer implements a path through a bigger model. It implements a, and you combine all those together and you have a graph based model of your system. If you recognize that, then you'll see common data between those and you can pull out the data and have data driven tests where you've modeled the data separately from the paths. And if you recognize that some of those paths are controlled by data, then when you pull those out, you can have a test which is a single flow but has multiple paths embedded within it which are triggered by the data that you feed through. So if we start thinking in these ways, we can automate differently. We don't have to have 50 tests written. We could have one flow with a variety of abstractions in the back end and a variety of data pumping through. So thinking through the model that we need here, we'll have page objects. They will abstract away the actual implementation from me. They will deal with all the locators. They will deal with what fields are in place. They will, I will use them to find out what values are in the page. We've got a workflow that we go through where we can go back and forwards between pages. And this ultimately is controlled by the data that I decide to put in because some of the fields are dependent on other data. We make different decisions based on the data that's coming through. And again, we can abstract the way in page object methods we can randomly generate the data because what I really want is valid data. I want to make sure that this system is viable to be tested manually. So all I really want to throw in is valid data. And if anything fails, the system is not ready for me to manually test yet. And I can scrape a lot of this stuff from the site. And we pool these different models together in the test. That's where it all starts coming together. A lot of the time in, in automation or testing in general, we get told that there are too many combinations. There's too much stuff that we can test. So we introduce combinatorial test design techniques is how they're sold to us. Really, there is combinatorial filtering techniques where you can objectively filter 
the scope of data in some way using orthogonal arrays or all pairs or whatever other mechanism you want. But sometimes with automation you don't want to filter, you just want to do lots of stuff, you want to cover every individual item and it doesn't really matter about the combinations because everything is valid together. And if you randomize it and just let it run for a long time and then run again, you'll pick up different problems. So it depends what problem you're trying to solve with the automation. So we don't have to do what tradition says. We can deal with lots of combinations in different ways. So thinking about the test data, we've got some fixed data. This controls the flow. This is in the, the drop downs, the countries for the registration. We have different age ranges that controls the flow through the, the workflow. And we can randomize this using a, a slot machine metaphor. So we have a big list of data in different reels. We pull the handle, the reels spin round to get us to a randomized start point with lots of different combinations all lined up for us. And then our test just starts running through those. We don't necessarily know what they are because they might vary between runs so we scrape them off the site. We have input field data which so long as it matches a certain format is okay so we'll just randomly generate that each time. And if you've got 200 countries that you want to make sure that you can register from, that's an awful lot of random data combinations that you're putting in through each test run. And if it takes six hours to run through this, then it takes six hours so you run it overnight or you run it on a different machine. It doesn't really matter that it's taken a long time because if it finds any problems, you investigate them.